Welcome to Emerging Languages Camp 2010. Aoki and Saf by Ola Bini. Okay, um, hello, and uh, yeah, my name is Ola Bini. I work for a consultancy called Bofferts, uh, and I am an amateur language designer and language implementer by night, basically. Um, I had 20 minutes to introduce two different languages here, uh, so we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm not sure if there will be much room for questions. Uh, I'll be, will be around, so if you have any questions, just cast me afterwards. Most of the talk is going to be about the first language, because the second language is, is kind of new, uh, like uh, three weeks of implementation or something like that. Um, so I'll just get started. So Ioki um, is a language experiment. Uh, it's a language experiment specifically to investigate expressiveness. And when I say expressiveness, People ask me to define it, and that's pretty tricky. Um, so I've kind of given up on defining expressiveness and instead talk about this from the angle of what I feel is expressive and what I feel gives you the right tools to communicate. Um, for me, programming languages is about communication. It's about communication with your team members, with yourself, but with the compiler, uh, with your team in five years and so on. And to me, expressiveness is about how can you make it possible to communicate as clearly as possible your intentions without actually embedding anything that is not about your intentions. Um, my view of expressiveness comes quite a lot from the Lisp family, uh, but also from Ruby. Um, I'm one of the Jira core developers, so that's kind of where I am from a language standpoint. Ioki is a dynamically typed language, just like those. Um, its closest parent is uh, Io. It's actually really similar to I.O. In, in the basic syntax and the basic runtime model. Um, if anyone is interested in major differences, I can talk about that later. But right now, um, I'm basically just going to talk about a few features of Ioki. Ioki is a very small language core uh, that allows you to add quite a lot of stuff, uh, which I've done. Uh, so this, are, this is a long section of stuff that I'm probably not going to cover at all whatsoever. Instead, I'm going to focus in on two or three different things that makes it possible to write expressive programs. And, and a big part of that is the way, um, the way the core language macros work and so on. Um, but yeah, I mean, most of this stuff is implemented in the language itself, and it's just, it's just there. So going back to the basi basics, the language is dynamic, strongly typed. Uh, it's prototype-based. Uh, when I designed the language, I want to for me, I wanted to have the core as small and simple as possible. To me, having um, instances and classes be two different concepts uh, is fine, but just having instances is much, more, is much simpler than having two different kinds of things. So that means that language core is kind of halved in size just because of that decision. Everything is based around message passing in, in the manner of small talk, not in the manner of actor-based languages. Uh, it's also a very mutable language. It embraces mutability. Everything is mutable. Uh, since it's a language experiment, I could get away with not doing anything about concurrency, for example. So you can't actually do anything when it comes to concurrency. That's not really what I wanted to explore. Uh, which means that you can do totally unsafe things all over the place. And there are no real problems with doing that because you can't share uh, to a different thread anyway. So the JVM is the home of this language because I didn't want to write all the all the other stuff. Uh, I wanted to focus on the language, uh, the language semantics themselves. And the garbage collector in the just-in-time compiler of Java just makes it very simple for me to do that. Uh, it turns out that it was really simple to port to the CLR. So the language also runs on the CLR. Uh, actually, it runs on a Mono 2. Uh, that was maybe two weeks of work work because I have a fairly extensive test suite of the language. So I could just basically run the tests until all the tests passed, and then I knew that I had a working watch of the language. Um, there are quite a few different features of the language that I like. One of my favorites is the condition system. Uh, condition system is basically a protocol for reasoning about uh, errors and problems that can happen during your, uh, during your program run. Uh, it's kind of high level comparison to, to exceptions. You can implement the condition system using exceptions. Um, I like it quite a lot because it makes it easier for people to talk about the protocols of what, what should someone do when something goes wrong. How can I fix this? Can I do something about this? And if so, I want to specify a protocol for how people can actually fix this. Because in general, uh, the exception systems is something like Java. You throw an exception when something goes wrong, 
and then the user of that library can catch that exception, but at that point it's really too late to do anything about it. So what you do is you you post it, you you just put the whole thing to a log file and uh, forget about it because there's really not that much you can do about it. Condition system allow you to uh, allow the library authors to say, okay, this can go wrong here. I'm going to signal a condition, but I'm also going to give you three different ways of getting back from this condition. Uh, and actually continue execution from that point on. And then you can choose, as a library user, you can choose, do I want to unwind the stack to this point, or do I want to continue execution by fixing this problem in this way, and so on. That's something I like quite a lot. It's got runtime macros. Those are not like list macros. List macros are load time or compile time. Uh, these are runtime macros. It's kind of an in-between between, between uh, call by name and, and um, regular macros because you actually get access to the messages that are sent in so you can modify and transform them and execute them and stuff like that. Um, IOP has more syntax than Lisp uh, but less syntax than most other languages. Uh, it's also part of the whole making the language extensible and core small and simple. So this is a small example of the shoe syntax because I wanted to have the core syntax be as small as possible. Operator precedence and things like that is actually something that I add on top of uh, a canonical syntax. So this is a sugar syntax that kind of shows some of the examples. Uh, I got some math here using regular precedence and I got I create a new list of stuff. I assign something into that stuff. This looks very much like Ruby style. It's almost exactly like Ruby actually. This one creates a new method and adds that to uh, on a slot on text and then you can call that method. So you can change everything. Everything is open. Uh, if you desugar that you will see that the, the syntax is quite similar, but there are things here that are changed. So the canonical syntax, equal sign, is a method call. The same thing is true here. You can do the sugaring of the operators, equal sign down here. Also, square brackets is also a method call, and square bracket assignment, and so on. So it takes the idea of assignment into places, just like, um, just like common lisp, quite seriously, which means that you can do things like uh, like this, where you do an assignment into a place that is specified by the first argument. Um, yes, actually, I had that on my slides. Anyway, there is also an internal syntax that you generally don't see. The canonical syntax you will see, but the internal syntax you will not see because it's kind of ugly. Uh, the reason it's ugly is specifically because literals is also model less message sending, uh, which means that you can override it and do stuff like that. That's pretty horrible from a performance standpoint but it allows you to do some pretty expressive things when you want to do DSLs, for example. Okay. So that's kind of the basic syntax. I have a small example, of, a typical example, where I use the features of the macro system to, um, to uh, kind of fold code into something that expresses the pieces that are necessary, but not the pieces that are not necessary. And this is something that actually happened with the implementation itself of Ioki going from the first release to the second release. Um, so I want to show you innumerable um, method called find. The behavior find, uh, find takes, uh, comes in two, three different forms. One form where you don't have any arguments at all. One form where you have one argument that is a message chain. And one form where you have two arguments where the first argument is the name of the argument. Uh, and, and the second one is kind of a place that uses that name to do something. All of these kind of do the same thing. They find something that is where, where the thing in the argument list returns true and then returns the original value. So here, 42 is the first true value, we'd have done that. Here we find the first square, uh, the first doubled value in the list from 1 to 100 and return that value, which is 44. Here we apply a regular expression to each string and return the string, the first string that matches. And finally here we return the first cube uh, that is larger than 100, which is 5. So this is fine. Sum is a very similar method. The only difference in sum instead of find is that sum will actually return the result of the execution on the right hand side instead of the original value. So here, when you, uh, when you do a regular expression match, the first regular expression match that matches will return a regular expression match, but the other ones will return nil because that's how regular expression match oops, sorry, uh, works in IOP and Ruby also for that matter. So the same thing is true with indexing into a string. If you index out of bounds, it will return nil. Otherwise, it will return the numeric, uh, the character of the place where it indexed. So this one will only work for full bar, which means that it will return the A in lowercase. So these methods are extremely similar. Uh, they all take the three different arguments. There are about 25 methods like this in the <coughs> core 
of enumerable that all do almost exactly the same thing, um, or rather they do the same thing three different times, but they're almost the same. Now, the initial implementation of find, this is not the one you will find in the, in the core, by the way, because uh, I've removed uh, everything in Ioki has a documentation string, so you associate documentation with everything in the system. I've removed that because uh, that makes the code, ex code examples quite, quite a bit longer. But everything else is exactly like it was in the first release of Ioki. Um, and what you can see here is that we get the argument, we check the length, and then we go through using each, and then if cell n is, um, is true, then we return it. If length is one, we evaluate the code on uh, the current ground, which is kind of lexical context outside of the call, and then we return the n value if that is true. And finally, if we get two arguments, we create a new lexical block using the, using the x name or the argument name. And then we evaluate that block and return n if it's true. Now, the other implementation is sum. And if you look really carefully, you will see the difference now. Um, did anyone see it? It's very small. It's, it's kind of spread. It's here, and it's here, and it's here. And the difference is that we return, in this case, we return the same. In this case, we return the evaluated value instead of n. And the same thing here, we return the result of evaluating the, the block. So this code is almost the same thing, but there are small pieces of code that kind of change inside of it. Uh, the new implementation in IOKI, the one that's shipped right now, excluding documentation string, looks like this. It's using a macro called enumerable default method. It takes three arguments. The first argument is what to do before iteration. The second argument is to what to do on each iteration. And the third argument is to what to actually do after iteration if nothing returns inside of here. So we return nil if we can't find anything. We return false if we can't find anything. Otherwise, x is the value after transformation, n is the value before transformation in this case. Uh, so here we can see that the difference between find is that we return n, the value before transformation in this case, but we return the value after transformation here. And that's the whole difference. Uh, and these three things are, are the only pieces that you need to kind of parameterize most of the enumerable methods to do something. And notice that you couldn't really, in a good way, use lexical blocks or uh, a closure or something like that, because we actually want to return from the, uh, from the enclosing thing, uh, uh, the generated method. So what this looks like in implementation, is like this. This is mostly a common Lisp style a code template, except that it's not common Lisp because it's actually object oriented. And uh, you can see here that we have something called a D syntax. D syntax just takes several arguments and destructures them uh, and returns a new template, which is in this case a D macro. It takes, you can see that this is almost exactly like the implementation originally of fine and sum, uh, except that we have these places where we insert the repetition code, we insert the return code, and return the, and the init code. Same thing here, init code, repetition code, return code. Init code, repetition code, return code. Uh, and this implementation is used in about 25 different enumerable methods. And I've been keep, keeping adding to the enumerable methods. And the, um, the, uh, the benefit of this is it's really easy to add new stuff if I want to. On the other hand, the whole cell x, cell n thing is it, not a very good public API, which is why I'm not uh, showing this that, that obviously. But this is a let-bound macro, so it's only available for the implementation of, uh, of the enumerable methods. It's kind of like a, um, an implementation detail. Okay, my final example in Ioki is um, the parser combinator library. Uh, this is example usage. It looks kind of like BNF. This is executable code that will return a parser. Um, and the way it's doing that is, is first taking kind of the, all of this, it takes us code, it transforms it into this, uh, where it gets the precedence right and so on. And finally, when it's done that, it uses the fact that you can override literal creation inside of a specific context, object-oriented, um, to take any literal that you find like this and just return a parser for that literal instead of the literal itself. Same thing is true here. We changed all the, uh, all the regular names, like letter here. Um, and put a prime inside in front of them, the prime method will just return a parser parser that delegates parsing to the parser uh, specified by the name letter here, for example. So this is what a parser context looks like. Internal create text is the method that is used to create a new text element uh, from, a, uh, from a literal. Uh, so we get a raw argument, create a new text parser, set the text to be the super call, so we actually get the real literal, 
and we do the same thing with number. And then down here is the implementation of the prime symbol uh, that takes a name and then returns a new parser parser with the name of that name. And then you can combine these in a purely object oriented way. So this is just an implementation of the dot dot method returns a new range parser, pipe returns a new or parser, and so on. And these are available all in the subcontext because the scopes are all object oriented. Okay, so that was exactly 15 minutes, which I'm pretty impressed by myself. Of. I didn't really actually expect that to happen. Uh, so the new language I'm working on is called Ceph. Um, and you will see some code samples. Most of them don't run yet. Uh, I'm pretty close to some of them running, but most of them are at this point kind of goals instead of actual real running code. Uh, the goal with Ceph is to take Ioki into the real world, and that means handling stuff like uh, concurrency. Uh, performance and other details. Um, Ioki is pretty slow, like 10 times slower than Ruby, maybe. <laughs> Something like that. I haven't spent much time optimizing it, but it's, it's pretty slow, um, because that's not really what I've been interested in looking at. Seth, um, at this point, Ioki is about 18 months old, and at this point I felt that I'd learned enough from Ioki that I uh, could start going away from Ioki and see what happens if I add some new things. Uh, mix around, stir, and see if I can make something that really uh, actually is useful for real programs. And it turns out that to do that, I had to steal from lots of languages. Um, I kind of have a differential feature list here that is the features that are different from Ioki. The first one, every object is immutable. The AST is immutable. In Ioki, you can change the AST that you're currently executing, uh, which is horrible from a performance standpoint because it's really hard to do just in time compilation. Uh, for example, in Ceph, everything, every object in the system is immutable. It's still a prototype-based object-oriented system, but everything is immutable. Um, but local variables are not immutable. They are mutable, so you kind of have the escape hatch of having local variables. And lexical scopes, uh, lexical closures, will also capture things in a way that can mutate the original lexical scope. So you have a big gaping hole of, of mutability that you can use if you want to. But hopefully, the other things that I steal from other languages will allow you to not do that. So, uh, lightweight threads in the style of kill him are um, going to be added, so you should be able to do things in a similar manner to uh, the way you work with message passing in Erlang. Uh, that includes doing proper TCO, which will be a performance hit, but I think it's worth it to, for the expressiveness. Um, I'm also stealing closures, uh, uh, concurrency primitives, uh, and also. Ah. I wonder, yeah, I have it on that slide. And also a full numeric tower. I didn't mention this, but Ioki doesn't actually have floats at all in the language. I, instead, everything is a big decimal because it feels like everyone is misusing floats so much these days. Uh, I've seen so much Java code that uses floats to, to represent, num uh, represent money, for example. Um, it's horrible. So in Ioki, I decided to do away with that. But I'm probably going back to uh, having floats in, in Ceph because um, I do want to have a real numeric tower with, uh, with uh, complex numbers and so on, and actually have that be reasonably fast. Um, so another way of looking at this is all the stolen features uh, and ideas from different places. Uh, most of it, as you can see, is from Clojure. Um, I steal uh, some ideas when it comes to the module system from Newspeak. Uh, the numerical tower is straight from Kava. Mostly everything else is from Ioki, basically. So just some code samples. Um, Paul Graham has this example of uh, how expressive your language is based on how small you can make an accumulator. Uh, now, this is kind of the uh, Ceph version of the accumulator. Um, the hash symbol creates an abstraction that is both uh, object scoped and lexical scoped. Um, that actually works when you have immutable objects because it's always easy to see which, which reference is what. Uh, a top level name is kind of followed by a colon symbol. There is a reason for that. In Ioki, colon, uh, name followed by colon, is used for keyword arguments. And the top level, uh, as I'll mention in a little bit while, a top level in Ceph is actually, uh, it's basically a method call uh, to something that creates a module. So anything that uses a keyword argument is something that should be uh, exported. This is the lightweight threads version, the, the kind of the Erlang style way of doing the same thing here. Um, so here I create a local method. This one is only accessible through lexical scoping, so it's not exported from the module. Yes. Um, tail recursive call to itself, and also start a new process and saving the pin. This is extremely similar to Erlang. And finally, tail recursive sets um, 
kind of an implementation of the ideas from Guy Steele's paper about uh, how important TCO is for object-oriented languages. Uh, the module system, I won't actually have time to talk about, uh, but the basic idea is that modules uh, are just regular Ceph objects and you have to specify what you import. It's not taking the Newspeak idea of, um, of having a platform object, but basically everything else is similar. Some resources and that's it. Thank <laughs> you.